Hey, so as we continue and improve our understanding of the internal structure of the atom, uh, it's going to help us to kind of understand just exactly where we've gotten from here uh, to kind of summarize uh, some of the things, specifically the two models uh, previous to Rutherford presented by uh, John Dalton and J.J. Thompson. So we get to this first model by uh, John Dalton right here, and um, one of the things that we just kind of said was, look, everybody who was pretty much educated in the world, for the most part, pretty much believed that all matter in the universe um, consisted of tiny little atoms. Um, and one of the main tenets of this model, um, even though there was a lot of evidence to suggest that it was viable, was that it was indivisible. Okay. They, in other words, they didn't think there was anything smaller. You couldn't break it down. So yeah, we accept that everything is made up of these tiny things, and that's a huge, huge paradigm shift in our understanding of the world around us. Um, some of the sizes of the, you could call them spheres, or just the atoms themselves, they can differ in sizes, um, but nonetheless, they're extremely, extremely tiny. And so this was a huge revelation uh, for humans itself. But it, we 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 learned. Um, from J.J. Thompson later on that this model would need to be revised. And so when Thompson came along um, with his cathode ray experiment, he proved that uh, by emitting uh, a cathode ray, he, just, he found out that the identity of a cathode ray was in fact um, the electrons. And so it kind of went from Dalton's idea of, hey, everything's indivisible. Yeah, it's made up of atoms, but it's indivisible. To all of a sudden, Thompson coming along and saying, look, the identity, the identity of this thing known as the cathode ray is something that's actually much, much smaller, about, um, what was it, about 2,000 times smaller than the hydrogen atom itself. So that suggested that there was something uh, subatomic right here. There was something much smaller than the atom itself. And so, again, uh, we see a huge paradigm shift in our, our understanding of the atom itself. Okay, so after Thompson comes along, um, one of Thompson's students, actually, uh, Ernest Rutherford, comes along and kind of changes the game again. Okay, so as we kind of continue in our understanding of the internal structure of the atom, we're up to this little point right here with, uh, with the question mark about where what does the atom look like now because clearly we we know now um, you guys knew by the time even in ninth grade um, that the that the atom certainly didn't look like this so let's get a little bit of an idea and understanding of um, what it looks like now and the experiment that led to this so looking into how this new model uh, Rutherford's model actually developed we got to take a second to look at uh, what he actually did in order to get there and, it's, and it was like the others is an ingenious experiment um, didn't look exactly like this but it's a nice little model to understand what happened and so it's known as uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment and it, it kind of shows it right here in the middle there, there's a very 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 thin piece of gold foil um, and what Rutherford had at the time and was kind of newly known um, in the early 1900s is a is something called a radioactive source. Radiation was uh, pretty new at the time, but he knew of uh, of a source, and um, this source just so happened to emit something um, known as an alpha particle, which for all intents and purposes um, is just a helium nuclei, and it consists of two uh, protons, which they didn't know at the time, um, and two neutrons. Okay, two protons and two neutrons. So overall, it had an overall, just that that one alpha particle had an overall positive charge. And that's going to be something um, important to remember for later on. Okay, so this, this little source down here, this lead source, constantly emitted these alpha particles and shot them straight out, almost like a gun. He could kind of tunnel them through here. Okay, and... What Rutherford expected to have happen was as he shot them through uh, or toward the gold foil, he expected the majority of them to just kind of just blatantly pass through. And uh, even though this diagram isn't the best representation of it, um, there are other diagrams out there that help give the impression that, look, as, as, as it shoots out of this radioactive source into the gold foil, it'll just kind of go through. And the vast, vast, vast majority of them did. Okay, well over 99% uh, of them just kind of shot through. Partial scattering involved right here, here, but the vast majority of them just kind of went through. Okay. 
But one thing you can see from this diagram that's, that's obvious is something completely unexpected happened. Um, one in about every 20,000 or so alpha particles, instead of going right through, they actually shot right back. And uh, Rutherford kind of, when he realized this and looked at the data, he kind of compared it to um, shooting a gun at a, at a at like a tissue paper, just a, almost like a Kleenex, and having that bullet just kind of be reflected back at you. Just something that was just so impossible, and it, he just couldn't understand why this happened. Because after all, if if that was really true, and it, and it was because the data told him so, he didn't think that this Thompson model right here was a good enough model because after all, if they are really going to shoot back and he knew that this was a positive charge, right? he understood that there must be some sort of repulsion going on in order for, for this to take place, for them to be shot back uh, 90 degrees or even more so. And he, thought, he knew this because uh, even though there was a positive charge in the Thompson model, it was distributed out throughout the entire thre- throughout the entire thing that the the pudding itself was the was the positive charge. So it would have just overall been too weak to make this happen. Um, and so he really kind of thought about it for quite some time as to how the heck this would even be possible. But after thinking about it for some time, he kind of came away uh, with with a couple characteristics of this of this new potential model um, that had to be true. And the one thing is is that um, whatever these these alpha particles are running into when they get here, because the vast majority of them just go right through, that must mean whatever they're hitting um, must be incredibly small, very small. And he knew this because if it if it was large, whatever they were hitting, if it was large, it would this this idea of just reflecting back or deflecting back would happen much more often. Okay, so whatever is hitting must be incredibly small. Um, and then the next thing he realized, which can kind of easily make sense to us, seeing that he knew this idea of an alpha particle being positively charged, this this overall positive charge right here. Because of that, whatever it's hitting must be positive as well. And not just positive, because after all, you know, like I said before, this Thompson model did have a positive charge in it, but not only is it positive, but it's incredibly uh, concentrated. Okay, so this positive charge is incredibly concentrated into a small space. Okay, so these these two little tenets right here, these characteristics, don't really fit into this Thompson model. They certainly don't fit into the Dalton model. That's kind of in the past now, but they, they don't fit into this whole idea of the Thompson model with the positive charge being distributed throughout. Um, it's certainly not small, and the positive charge certainly isn't concentrated. So what he does is he, he thinks about this a little bit more and kind of comes up with a new model. And so this new model, um, if I can kind of bring in this picture real quick, hang on a second, kind of con- shows a good uh, contradiction of getting rid of of Thompson's model. Okay, so up above is 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 Thompson. All right, this is the the Thompson's plum pudding, and this one is kind of reflective of what Rutherford thought was going on. And it, and you can see now um, taking the two characteristics that we talked about earlier, um, and then with this small central little core right here. It, it kind of fits both what we were talking about. First off, it is positive and it's incredibly concentrated. And it's also really small with, with respect to the rest of the atom. Okay, so in comparison to the rest of the atom, this is incredibly small. And so this was known as uh, the nuclear model. Okay, and it completely changed everything because in a sense it was the discovery, it led to the discovery of the nucleus. Okay, something that wasn't known about at the time. Okay, and uh, if you think about it nowadays, this is a huge revelation because so much of our world and potentially our um, our energy source might come from something at the nuclear level. Uh, we have power. We have nuclear power plants running uh, all across the world right now. Um, we've made nuclear bombs that have completely destroyed societies, and so it's had a huge effect, huge impact on um, human innovation and human uh, history, okay, throughout throughout time, at least in the past hundred years or so, 
Okay, so it, it was a big deal. Um, also, it really led to the discovery of, of, of the proton as something that has a, um, a positive charge, even though the nucleus is comprised of the uh, proton and the neutron. The neutron wasn't discovered until later, and so we'll just leave it out for now. Um, but this is a big deal because this little area right here, so much of what an atom's identification relies on um, happens within, within here. And in fact, the, the, the proton itself is responsible responsible for an element's identity. Okay, and uh, as we kind of continued our under understanding of things like radiation and things like that, which would kind of continue on throughout the years and is still going on, um, it, it helps us understand the identity of elements, why, why elements decay uh, through radiation and things like that. And it's even helped us, you know, be able to understand things like, um, uh, you know, cancer treatments and things like that. Uh, why it might not be the best idea to live in Chernobyl. Um, some of the the Japanese um, power plant that that uh, that went down a couple years ago, and why that led to such mutations um, in Hiroshima and things like that. So just getting an, a firm understanding of what is happening inside here um, was a huge deal. And so one thing I want to kind of show real quick in this, in this new slide is um, another picture that kind of just lays out the inferences that were, that were made by Rutherford. Okay, so if I kind of shrink this down a little bit, right, just to kind of summarize everything, um, you see his gold foil experiment kind of going on and this is a little bit better diagram he has his radioactive source all these beams of alpha particles which again are just two protons and two neutrons and they're positively charged going through this gold foil which has an overall neutral charge and uh, so because of that they're going to go pass right through and one thing that I kind of forgot to mention that's incredibly important with this is that uh, one of the things he realizes that the majority of an atom is complete empty space empty space. And you can kind of reason that because if it wasn't, the majority of them wouldn't just pass right through. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, some of them were kind of deflected a little bit, but like I have been saying, the majority of them just went right, right through. And it's because they could, it was just empty space, right? But once in a while, once in a very, very great while, they would hit that nucleus, that incredibly positively charged, well-concentrated area, and they'd get deflected back. Okay, and that was the main thing that led him um, to this whole nuclear model. Okay, so um, most alpha particles traveled through the foil and deflected, and that's where you get the atom is mostly empty space. Some of the par alpha particles are deflected by small angles. Like I said, you could have a, a, a positively charged area from this. You could kind of deduce that whatever was hitting was positively charged. And then occasionally the alpha particles would hit what was eventually known as the nucleus, and so the nucleus must not only be positive, but it must be incredibly dense in the sense that it must carry um, the majority of the atom's mass, and that was found out to be true as well.